If you've started working with sound in the digital realm, maybe you have a home studio, or you're trying to record your guitar, or maybe you're making a podcast and you have a microphone and you're trying to record your voice. At some point in your journey, and hopefully earlier on, you're going to want to know about how sound works in the real world. What actually is a sound? And what are its physical properties that help us describe it and help us understand how it actually works. Why do we want to do this? Because if we understand how a sound actually works in the physical world, we will be better able to manipulate it in the digital realm. So this lecture is for beginners. If you're just starting out and you want to know how sound works in the real world. In this lecture, I'm going to define sound. I will give you two terms, frequency and amplitude talk about what those are, and I will look at some visual representations of these physical properties in our digital audio tools. Okay, what is sound? Essentially, a vibration. Some energy moving back and forth. All sound needs four things. An energy source, something to actually create that vibration. Two is the vibration itself. Three is a medium, something for that vibration to propagate through so that it can continue to travel through the world. So typically this is air. If I'm speaking, my vocal cords are creating the vibration. The vibration is moving through the air, going over to your ears. Inside your ear, you have an eardrum, which is the fourth property here, the receiver. Your eardrum also vibrates, which tells your ear and your brain in some magical fashion, hey, there's some sound happening in the world, some change in air pressure, which we read as sound, and maybe you should pay attention to it. There are two basic physical properties of sound to know first. One is amplitude, and two is frequency. Amplitude is the size of the vibration. This is sometimes also called strength or intensity or energy and also sometimes volume or loudness but there's asterisks and italics there on my screen for a, for a good reason and I'll get to that in just a second because it's not exactly loudness or volume. We'll get to that. So the second is frequency which is the speed of the vibration. How fast is it actually vibrating back and forth? This is measured in hertz which is cycles per second. Uh, and we experience this as pitch. So let's listen to this. This is one sine tone, one frequency that is at a speed of 440 hertz per second. Oh, it's not because I was doing this earlier. Let me type this in. 430. Shall we go with 430? Why not? And we'll turn the amplitude down so I don't bust your ears. Okay. 430 hertz per second, this is what it sounds like. As I move my amplitude up, I'm gonna bring it up higher. You hear it's getting louder and softer. We sort of experience this as loudness, right? Keep the, hold that thought, we'll be right there. Frequency we experience as pitch. So here's 430 if I move it down or up. Okay, and stop that. So why, why am I saying that amplitude and volume are not the same thing? So volume or perceived loudness is a cognitive perception of amplitude, which is a physical property. And our brains and our ears experience loudness with slight variations than is directly related to its physical property. This graph shows that these are the Fletcher Munson curves, probably don't need to know this. If you look at this graph, it's showing us that frequency over here on the, the horizontal axis, so over on the left side we have very low tones, and on the, uh, the y-axis we have sound pressure level amplitude, okay? And the lines are showing us perceived loudness. So lower tones here we are experiencing as louder and as the lower tones move up across here 
our loudness, our, our experience of loudness is going down even though the sound pressure level is remaining the same. Until we get to 5,000 hertz and then weird things start happening. All of this to say is, yes, it's okay to think of amplitude as, as volume or loudness for your everyday work. It's not exactly linearly, linearly mapped. Okay, so how high can we hear? What's the highest frequency that we can hear? Well, we often state here that humans have a range of hearing from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. This is when you're born, you can hear up to 20,000 hertz. As you get older, this often falls dramatically, especially once you hit 30. I'm somewhere now around 14,000 hertz. You can actually test this for yourself. Uh, I did it in max. This, the highest pitch I showed here was 3,000 because well, it doesn't sound very fun or very nice to listen to, um, but you could play tones that are much higher and just keep going higher until you can't hear it anymore, and then you know how high you can hear. Be careful if you do this. This is dangerous for your ears. Keep the volume low. All right. When we're working with audio, it is important for us to have visual representations of these physical properties so that we can see what they are and manipulate them with our user interface of our computer. So if you've worked with sound at all, you've probably seen something like this. This is a waveform. This is a screenshot from Audacity. Or perhaps you have seen something like this. This is this colorful thing at the bottom is a spectrogram. So let's come over to Audacity. And knowing now what we know about frequency and amplitude, let's see if we can figure out what these visual represent representations are actually showing us. So here we have A440, which is one single frequency. It's called a sine tone. And we heard this before in Max. Let's listen to it here. OK. Sine tones don't exist in nature. Like one single tone does not exist. We had to generate this with a computer. All sound in nature that we experience, we can think of as being a mix or a bunch of these different single frequencies all played together at the same time. So let's listen to more and more frequencies heard at the same time. This is a guitar. Okay. And this is uh, also a guitar, but playing a chord. Here's a song. Okay. Um, and I have some speech, which I will show you in just a second. Here in the blue, we have a waveform, and we see this displacement, the movement back and forth. So the air pressure is pushed forward and then released, and pushed forward and then released. And we draw this in a waveform like this, with an up and down. Let's look here at this waveform, which looks similar but different from our single tone. So what is happening here? What actually is a waveform? Right? OK, so imagine you have a bunch of kindergartners. Bear with me a bunch of kindergartners jumping on a trampoline, and they're all jumping at different speeds or frequencies, okay? You've got a bunch of them, and they're jumping. What is happening to that trampoline that they're jumping on? It's moving up and down in response to those different rates, those different frequencies of the kindergartners vibrating it, essentially, right? Moving it up and down. So a waveform is a graph of the trampoline displacement. How high it's going from its natural state and how far it's compressed from its natural state. Now, if these kindergartners are all jumping at different rates, but consistent, right? They, if you've got one, the like Joey, I don't know, Joey and Anna, right? Joey's jumping really fast, and, but he keeps jumping really fast. He doesn't vary his speed. Anna's also not varying her speed. She's going much slower. All the kids are going at these different rates. If you have 
those rates that are not changing. You end up with a regular pattern. And even though it doesn't look like a single up and down, like if you only had one kindergartner jumping at a single rate on a trampoline, you do get rep a repeated pattern. So as you're looking at this waveform, you'll notice that the cycle, though it has bumps in it, is repeated over and over again. Down below, we have our spectrogram. The best way for me to illustrate this is with a song. So we're adding in much, much, many more frequencies. We've got a whole band here playing. And the waveform is doing a great job of showing us amplitude. Right, you can see that all of these are drum hits. You can see where they're happening. This waveform, though, is not doing a great job of illustrating those individual frequencies how fast those individual kindergartners waveforms are actually jumping up and down. So for that, we use a spectrogram. So here we have on the horizontal axis of our, wa of our waveform and our spectrogram, we have time. Cross this way. Oh, my hand disappeared. Sorry. On the y-axis of our waveform, we have this amplitude, this displacement. On the y-axis of our spectrogram, we have frequency. So we have 0k, 1k, 2k, 3k, 4k, so uh, starting at 0 and then 1,000 hertz, 2,000 hertz. And then the color is mapped to amplitude. So the white color down here at the bottom is our strongest, our highest amplitude. And then it goes on from there where you've got reds and orange and, and pinks and fading to blues. So let's look at the guitar as an example of this. So our guitar tone, we have just one pitch plucked on a guitar. The, the highest concentration the, of these, uh, these loud, louder frequencies are here at the bottom between zero and a thousand hertz. And up at the top, we do have some of these frequencies happening, but they're quieter. As we add in a chord, you see we start to get these elongated bands over here of these higher tones that last for longer and that are a little bit louder in the tone. And then once we get over here where we've got our drums and we've got multiple instruments playing, you see these vertical bands starting to pop in here. It kind of looks like a ladder. And you see that you have these relationships in your instruments of at these mathematical like multiples uh, in your frequency, uh, frequency bands. This can get really fun and really exciting. It also gets very complicated quickly. So we won't really go into all what that all means, but you can tell visually from this spectrogram where you have frequencies and what their amplitudes are in this song. Lastly, where this gets really interesting here is with speech. So this is an excerpt from a recording from the Supreme Court. We'll hear argument this morning in case 17. Okay, and you can see, again, we have these louder um, speech sounds down at the bottom. This is about mm, 15,000 hertz. And that's when you hear the, the normal vocalized speech. When he says consonants, you get these higher frequency bands, and you can actually see them right in here, right? If I move this over, I can actually point to it, okay? Right here, he says S. And the letter S, you don't hear as a vocalization, but you do hear the S, the consonant sound, and these are higher frequencies. Let's listen. We'll hear argument this morning. This. This, this morning in case 17. Isn't that cool? Because what you can do with this is you can use this to start to analyze sounds, to analyze speech, and start to understand that that's how a computer can start to understand what someone is saying. So cool, right? Okay, I'm going to play you out.